This is the first video in the chapter on Feed Forward. The first few chapters in this book then derived basic MPC algorithms and the viewer will recognize that the typical performance index we use there included a term based on future targets. So here's an example of future targets. You can see I've got the target one sample ahead, the target two sample ahead, all the way up to the target NY samples ahead. However, if you looked at the videos in the first five chapters, you will also have noticed that we made an implicit assumption that the future targets were all the same value. There was no changes. This chapter then is, is going to consider the implications of using information about future changes in target. So we're no longer going to assume that the future targets are all the same value, but we're going to use the actual values assuming we know what they are. This video then is going to begin by simply demonstrating the control law and behavior that results from including this future information. Later videos in the chapter will seek to understand the behavior that we're observing and thus make proposals, and this is key, how do we use this information wisely? Using information doesn't necessarily mean you get a better result if the information is used unwisely. For simplicity, this chapter is going to focus on finite algorithms such as GPC, as it's easier to demonstrate the key issues. However, as will be shown at the end of the chapter, the same concepts do apply equally to dual mode approaches. Let's have a look then at GPC, remind ourselves of what we know. The predictions are given by an equation a bit like this. So the future output predictions, some matrix times the future um, input increments, some matrix times the past input increments, and some matrix times the past outputs. Typical performance index, if you substitute those predictions in, you'll see I've got a term here which has got the future um, set point targets, that's this R future term, minus the future output predictions and then essentially I've got the square of this term because I've written it twice here and then I've got a term which has got the square of the future control increments. If I minimize this with respect to my degrees of freedom, the future control increments, I end up with a control law a bit like this where you see the future input increments depend through some matrix on the future targets and the past inputs and the past outputs. Now that was all covered in the earlier chapters, so we're just reminding you of the key expressions. If I expand this out a bit, so that's what we just wrote on the previous slide, then you'll notice there's some particular terms. So we've got a term that multiplies on our future, and I'm going to call that term PR, and you can see PR has got the definition given over here. I've got a term which multiplies on the delta u past, and I'm going to call that dk check, and that's given here. And we've got a term that multiplies on y past, and I'm going to call that nk. Now again, you remember, we did derive this in the earlier chapters, which is why we're doing it very quickly. The focus in this video, or this chapter, is going to be on the term which multiplies the future targets. And you'll see I've just circled that there. So in particular, we're interested in this PR times R future term. So let's expand it. So there's our control law. The feed forward term, which is this term here, can be expanded by recognizing that PR has got NY terms. So I've given those as P1, P2, all the way up to PNY. And they multiply our future, which is RK plus 1, RK plus 2, all the way down to RK plus NY. So I can see explicitly how future target information affects the control law, which is the current choice of the control increment. And it's going to be through these terms here, P1, P2, all the way up to PNY. And what is obvious is that future targets have a direct impact on the current control move. So the thing you might want to emphasize there is RK plus NY, so that's a target, NY samples into the future actually affects the choice of the current input. And that will not surprise you because you'll, for example, know that when you drive, you look ahead and if you can see a corner some distance in the future, that will affect the decision making that you do now. 
So that's quite normal and intuitive. What we're going to do now is present some simulations to demonstrate the impact of using this feedforward information for a number of different scenarios, that is, with various input and output horizons. So here's the first example. GPC 6 underscore 1 unders underscore example 1. And as ever, these MATLAB files are on the Google site should you want to run them yourself. So when I've done NU equals 1, what do you notice? You notice with advanced knowledge, I get an output curve here. You'll see that the input starts moving very, very early, 20 samples before the target actually changes. As a consequence, the output starts moving early. And what you can do is compare that to the performance you would have got, that's this line here, if you didn't have advanced knowledge. And you'll see very different behavior. But here's the key thing. I would argue that this output is responding rather too soon and rather slowly. I really didn't want it to start responding 20 samples ahead, and I really didn't want it to respond quite this slowly. If I increase the control horizon, here I've made the control horizon 2, you'll see the behavior gets even worse. Look, this output here, you get this massive undershoot before it then moves quite fast to the uh, new target, and you'll see the input has got a similar shape. So what have we seen? The key thing here is using advanced knowledge about the target has actually made behavior worse. It's not made it better. Now, if I use an even higher NU, you might say, well, maybe I've just not got NU high enough. You'll remember in one of the earlier chapters we said, if NU is too small, you can get rather poor behavior. Let's make NU bigger. So here, I've made NU equal 3. And still, you can see the output behavior down here is really quite poor, and it's not doing what you would expect it to do. If I make the, out, the input horizon even larger, here I've got NU equals 5. Yeah, things might be slightly better with an NU equals 3, but still, all this jittering around here before the target actually changes is just not needed. Different example then. Example 2, an example with different dynamics. And you see the same type of concept happening. The output response is really rather slow and rather too soon. I don't need the output to start reacting all the way down here to follow this target so many samples in the future. In fact, you should be able to get a response that does something like this. And so I'm not getting anywhere close to that using this advanced information. And here you can see what happens with NU equals 2, and you might say, again, this is really quite poor. There's such a non-minimum phase dip, and I do not need that. Here's with NU equals 5, and yes, it's better, but we're still going up and down and whatever, and it's not as good as it could be. Here's example 3, again, a system with very different dynamics, and once more, you see a nasty dip and a rather slow response. And here's with NU equals 5, and again you see this messing around. OK, a fast response when you get close, but a lot of messing around beforehand. And a finally different example, example 4. And again you see a rather slow response um, in transients. If I increase NU, I've got a lot of messing around here, which isn't needed. And if I take NU equal to 5, yes, it's beginning to get better, but do I really need all of this behavior here? before the target changes. So what's the summary? We've demonstrated that the default definition of MPC does include information about future targets. And this information explicitly affects the control law to a fixed feedforward term. Now, the use of an optimization of predictive performance would lead you to expect that including future target information would improve tracking. You're saying, I'm giving you better information about what the target's doing, so surely when you optimize, I'm going to get better tracking. But what did we notice? It's clear that, in fact, the opposite can be true. If you include more accurate information, then actually you can make the performance worse. And that's a really important insight before we go into this chapter, that you understand just because I can use information doesn't mean I should. 
first of all, I need to be able to use the information wisely.